matter of the state of Idaho versus Aaron von Ellinger as to the charge of rape and count one, we the jury unanimously find the defendant guilty. Well, a verdict was issued today in the trial of former state representative Aaron von Ellinger. He is found guilty of rape. The jury deliberated for 11 hours before making their decision. The judge ordered that Von Ellinger be remanded into the custody of the Ada County Sheriff's Office until his sentencing on July 28th. Von Ellinger was taken out of the courtroom this afternoon in handcuffs minutes after the verdict was announced. And our Andrew Bartline has been following the trial for us this week. And Andrea, want us to walk us through the emotion, really, what was going on in the courtroom as they announced the verdict and the moments after? Well, they reached their verdict a little after 1 p.m. And you mentioned 11 hours of deliberation. I mean, this started yesterday in the early evening. So they went all day yesterday, coming into today, again, around 1 p.m. Jurors walked back into the courtroom, and only one of the jurors looked at Von Ellinger. Every other juror, all other 11 of them, looked at the floor or they glanced at the prosecution. Von Ellinger had been cool, calm, collected, and relaxed the entire trial, maybe losing his patience with the prosecution for a few minutes yesterday during cross-examination. Largely, he seemed relaxed. After the verdict convicting Von Ellinger of rape, his face went red. You could see sweat on the back of his neck, and the overhead lights of the room reflected off the back of his neck as the bailiff took him into custody. So as he's walking out of that room, Joe, that was the moment where you could tell kind of hit him. He seemed really calm, cool, and collected through the trial till that verdict came. And after the verdict and after uh, the courtroom cleared, I understand that the media had a few minutes to talk with the prosecutors about this case. And there's a moment I want to go back to. If you haven't been following the trial, a few days ago, Jane Doe took the stand. And in the middle of her testimony, she stood up and said, I can't do this. And she left the room. And because of that, there was no chance for cross-examination from the defense. So anything that Jane Doe had said on the stand or really uh, what had happened inside the courtroom, the jury had to forget that. So I guess the question for you and the question I had for the prosecution, how did that impact their case? What did they detail to you about how that, I mean, really major part of this case unfolded and affected them going forward? Well, at the moment of it, from the outside looking in from the press's perspective, you immediately start thinking mistrial, right? Because there wasn't an opportunity for cross-examination. The defense told uh, Judge Reardon they weren't interested in filing a mistrial um, even after Jane Doe left. So you realize that there are two people in the room when the assault went down. There's Von Ellinger and Jane Doe. Von Ellinger got his testimony on the record. Jane Doe did not. So at that moment, you immediately start thinking that this is a big hit to the prosecution. But as we learned, the prosecution says without Jane Doe's testimony, this was a possibility they were planning for even from the beginning. Whitney and I prepared this case knowing it would be very difficult for her uh, to even enter the courtroom, let alone take the stand. Uh, so while we, um, again, heart-wrenching to see that, um, from her and those emotions that it took from her. Uh, we had prepared this case knowing that that was potentially a possibility. So again, if you're just joining us here at 5 o'clock on the 208, some uh, breaking news this afternoon. Former state representative Aaron Von Ellinger was found guilty by a jury uh, on the charge of rape. He was found not guilty on a different charge. Uh, but Andrew, I guess the question is, what happens next going forward? You mentioned that Von Ellinger was taken out of court in handcuffs. Where do we go from here? Well, he now has to register as a sex offender after being uh, convicted guilty of rape. Uh, he also pre-sentence investigation in psychosexual evaluation. Now, Joe, basically what these mean, is there's an evaluation that's going to take place with Aaron Von Ellinger. The psychosexual evaluation is more narrowly tailored toward the likelihood to uh, recommit a sexual crime. The other evaluation, just generic um, evaluation in general. So that is going to be weighed heavily with the judge in terms of sentencing. You mentioned that sentencing date, July 28th. Um, and in terms of the potential of what this punishment could be, it has to be at least one year, um, but could be up to life in prison. So uh, there's not a spectrum wider than that. Yeah, so Judge Reardon, I guess, um, has his work cut out for him. I guess over the next few weeks, they're going to do some testing and they're going to do some analysis on Mr. Von Ellinger as a way uh, for the judge to kind of legitimize and talk about why he's going to give down the sentence. But as Andrew mentioned, it could be anything from um, no less than a year all the way up to life in prison. So a pretty big disparity there. Um, of course, I do want to mention if you uh, are interested in more of the coverage, Andrew and our Katie Terhune were in the courtroom today and they have full details right now at KTVB.com. Yeah, and Katie's done a fantastic job. Her live tweets going minute by minute. She's done a great job detailing this start to finish. All right, Angie, we'll have more coming up at 6. Thank you very much. Well, for now, though, let's move on to this. The big debate that was right here at Channel 7 last night, it was the GOP primary debate for Secretary of State. 
Ada County Clerk Phil McGrain, Senator Mary Souza, and Representative Dorothy Moon debated here for about an hour last night. And a big topic last night was a continuation from the Secretary of State debate on Idaho Public Television that happened earlier this week. Now, during that, candidates debated Facebook and the political donations they reportedly were pushing into the state of Idaho. They also discussed the new Facebook metadata center that is supposed to go in in CUNA. Now, time ran out during the conversation during the Idaho Public Television debate, so we kicked off our debate last night, continuing that topic and letting candidates respond to hanging questions. First, Senator Souza defended her yes vote on tax incentives for data centers. She says it has nothing to do with Facebook when she voted. Our debate the other night ended quickly and I didn't have a chance to rebut the question. So yes, the data center that is going up in CUNA was was allowed by a vote of the Senate and the legislature in, in whole back in 2020, nine months before we ever had the presidential election and 12 months before we ever knew that any Facebook money had come into our elections. So when we voted in, in favor of the data center, it was a generic tax exemption bill. It had nothing to do with Facebook and no one knew about it. So Senator Souza clarifying her vote for us last night, and then we head on next to Representative Moon. Moon had maintained concerns throughout the debate about Facebook and their involvement in elections and in Idaho in general. Representative Moon says that the concerns about the Facebook data center extend beyond just Facebook as a corporation to her. Dispute at the end was whether uh, Mike Bidel was that whether or not she supported the bill, and I did not. Uh, the fact of the matter is Zuckerberg really doesn't come into the play. The fact of the matter is that that bill was bringing in a data center, and the thing is that most Idahoans do not want their data collected. They do not want it used against them in the future. This is not really the type of business that Idahoans would like to see come into this state. And finally, Clerk McGrain addressed taking money from a nonprofit as Ada County Clerk to help run elections during COVID. Now, that nonprofit took donations from Facebook and leaders, namely Mark Zuckerberg and his wife. Now, McGrain was criticized during the debates for taking that private money. The concern being from the other candidates that private money could influence public elections in an unfair way. McGrain explained his rationale for taking the grant money providing safety for poll workers, providing safety for voters. It was a huge undertaking. Our expenses skyrocketed. During that election, there was a five-fold increase in the use of absentee ballots by local voters. And with that comes five times the expense. We sought that grant because we wanted to ensure that Idahoans could vote at the polls on election day. I'm proud that we were able to keep all of our polling locations open here in Ada County, and we even provided training for state employees to assist with other counties. This money was essential, but I think one of the main things I do agree, we need to provide adequate funding to keep our elections secure. If you're interested, you can watch the full debate right now on KTVB.com. Turning pages, it all started one night at Redfish Lake and Sawtooth National Recreation Area, like most good ideas do, over a glass of bourbon. A group there looked up at the sky that night, and they saw all the stars, and they said, we can do this. This was creating the Central Idaho Dark Sky Reserve in 2017, about three years after the first conservation. Now, the reserve is about 1,400 square miles that stretches from Sun Valley to beyond Stanley and encompasses several wilderness areas. It was the first and remains the only such reserve in the United States. And the goal was to preserve the natural night sky for current and future generations. This being International Dark Sky Week, we wanted to learn more about this special place from one of the men involved in the initial conversation that night at Redfish Lake. Matt Benjamin spent 15 years teaching astronomy and running the planetarium at the University of Colorado in Boulder. But he's been coming to Idaho since he was just six months old. And he has a home just outside of Ketchum, and he serves on the board of the Idaho Conservation League. Matt explains to us why Central Idaho's Dark Sky Reserve is so unique. If you're not used to it being that dark um, and that many stars, the darkness can be intimidating. And I think that's part of it. Plus, they'll see things they've never seen before. A lot of people from cities don't ever see the Milky Way. And when they see the Milky Way, the, it, I mean, it hits them emotionally. It never gets old for me as someone who spent years teaching astronomy and especially teaching the public is, is those emotional connections to seeing um, nature in its most pristine state. 
this dark sky reserve in central Idaho, it seems like it's a perfect spot for it. Yeah, yeah. When you look at sort of a, a, a light pollution map, there's a lot of great satellite images that show light pollution uh, across the US. And there's very few purely dark spots left. So geographically speaking, uh, it, it just made sense. It was also what the Sawtooth Valley is by day that I think made it just this perfect spot because it's arguably one of the most gorgeous places in the lower 48. And then by night, it, it, it sort of turns into this other thing of, of pristine uh, darkness. And so I think the combination of those things make it just one of these most perfect spots to have a dark sky reserve. The idea of setting up these reserves and keeping them this way, why is that so important? A couple of the public lectures I would do was archaeoastronomy, which would be talking about astronomies of our ancient cultures. The sky was an anchor point. The heavens and, and, and their gods and everything was anchored to the cosmos and the heavens. And what I found so interesting is that we've lost that connection because of modern technology. When you understand your place in the cosmos, I think it also gives us a greater appreciation of Earth. It also helps us underscore how fragile our planet is, how unique life is on this planet. And there's just this richness that I think comes from being able to see the cosmos as it was intended to be seen. It's a powerful thought there, and Dark Sky Week ends tomorrow night with the goal of limiting light pollution around the globe. There are only 20 dark sky reserves in the entire world, but pretty soon Idaho's dark sky reserve won't be the only one in the country. Right now they're currently in the process of turning a section of southern Colorado's St. Louis Valley into the Sangre de Cristo International Dark Sky Reserve. And Matt says it will dwarf the size of Idaho's. Fridays on the 208, we like to reach back into our story bag and revisit some notes that were popular or fun, because what a week it was. And guess what we found? An aspiring 208 correspondent in Nampa. Ahead, we're going to introduce you to Lydia, who is creating her own 208 newscast. But before we bid adieu for the weekend and head into the first great weekend of spring, we want to hear from you. Questions, comments, concerns. Let's end the week on a high note, right? 208. 321-5614. But before you hit that send button, make sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to answer and address some of your comments live on air at the end of the show. I went to the KTVB app and I got all of my new stuff from there. Oh man, that's perfect. Sounds just like our promotional team had written that, but they hadn't. We didn't write that. Lydia did. On Tuesday, we introduced you to a different type of the 208, and that's 10-year-old Lydia, who you just heard from. That's Lydia Fletcher. She loves watching the news, and because of that, the sixth grader at Greenhurst Elementary decided that she would recreate her own newscast earlier this year. 
and her newscast, well, they caught our eye because, well, how could it not? We think we do the 208 pretty well. Let's see how Lydia does it. Hi, welcome to the Fletcher Family News. Back in January, Lydia Fletcher was stuck at home. I guess I was just bored. I was just bored. The longest serving Idaho mayor retires, Norm Steadman. You know, Lydia, a lot of kids uh, to cure boredom likely wouldn't turn to news. I mean, most kids do like Le Lego movies or they do go outside and do, you know, TikTok stuff or whatever, but not you. No, I do the news. <laughs> <laughs> I just like it because it's like a small little community. Just a small community. Yeah, that's true. It is. We're going to start off with COVID cases. Which is exactly how Lydia's video adventure began. We were quarantined because we had COVID. As you can see, we started down with zero cases on Monday. So basically, I was telling how each member of my family got it throughout three days. It slowly climbed to two cases. Like, my sister and my dad got it first, I think. But then it grew by Wednesday. And then my mom got it. And then me and my younger sister. Everyone in the family has go. She even included... Yeah, we're here with the seven-day forecast. A weather report. Here's the forecast. That impression of Larry Gebert with the self-made stuck-on stash is what led Lydia's mom to share the videos on social media shortly after his sudden passing. He was my favorite weather reporter. He was. I know. He's a lot of people's. So it's going to start with... And... That is our seven-day forecast. Back to you. Like, how often would you say you watch the news? Like, every day. Every day? <laughs> yeah. But like, every morning, the first thing that turns on is the news, and then every afternoon, we watch the 208. Thanks, Larry. Now for our 208. Oh, yeah. There was even a nod to us. For our 208, Lydia using screen time for news time about a is just fine with her mom. They get to play on their electronics, but part of it is they have to do something creative and use it as a tool. So no other plans to do uh, to do anything else? Uh, no plans. I just make it up as I go. Now for our astronomy forecast. Boy, she puts uh, Brian and I to shame. She does a whole newscast all by herself. And if you didn't know, there's some wonderful people behind the scenes that do a lot of work. So Lydia, you're off to a great start. But we got some more details here for you. Lydia doesn't necessarily have plans to do more of these videos. So let's wait and see. But she is right now looking forward to her 11th birthday coming up in July. By the way, by no means do we agree with WC Fields. We love working with kids. In fact, we want to hear from other kids out there who may be watching the 208 or run into this sometimes, especially in the form of questions. Like we told you earlier this week on Tuesday, here's what we'd love to see you share with us. You know, some electronics for good. Record your questions on your cell phone or on your Zoom camera and with some video and tell us something that you want to know and maybe we'll be able to answer it for you. Maybe you want to know who is WC Fields. We'll have to look into that one for you. But doesn't matter what it is, if you got a 208 young fan at home, we'd love to hear from, especially here on a Friday. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll be expecting some text messages coming in in the next few moments. So we will get to those later on. But Lydia and her family, we uh, say hello if you're watching here on the 208 on Friday. For now, though, we'll step aside. We'll be right back after this.
almost ready to put the month of April in the books, and it has been a cooler than average month, almost uh, four and a half degrees below average for the month so far. That's taking all the lows, all the highs, putting it in one nice little number, and today is no exception. Cooler than average temperatures right now, almost 10 degrees below seasonal averages. We've had a pretty picturesque spring sky throughout the day today, though, getting those puffy cumulus clouds as we're kind of between two systems. Our system from yesterday continues to pull off to the east, but it does leave us with an enough active weather around the region to give us those puffy clouds and a few showers for our mountain areas. And we have more wet weather, more spring showers on the way in for us for the weekend. It's not a complete washout either of the days, but you will want to have the rain gear on standby and maybe even just have a plan B for any outdoor plans at any given time in case you need to bring it in for a time before you head back out. We'll also get some sunshine through the weekend as well. So timing this out, I think it looks more likely to catch in on some wet weather midday into tomorrow afternoon. That's especially true for the mountain areas and for the Treasure Valley on Saturday. Really, the wet weather becomes more of a Magic Valley thing into Sunday. Can't rule out slight chance for an isolated thunderstorm. This would be tomorrow evening into the later hours of the evening. So a distant rumble of thunder and a bout of heavy rain not out of the question for tomorrow. And as I mentioned before, wet weather moving into South Central Idaho for the second half of the weekend. But we know April showers eventually bring May flowers. Quick look at our highs for tomorrow. Low 60s, good deal of cloud cover for the Magic Valley. Central Mountains getting some rain snow mix when the temperatures are coolest in the early hours of the day. West Central Mountains mainly with rain showers in our mountain valleys. And for the Lower Treasure Valley and Upper Treasure Valley, temperatures are about 5 to 7 degrees below seasonal averages as we head into the month of May and the active weather pattern continues. So a forecast to stay on top of, you can do so at KTVB.com.
Well, friends, we've made it to the end of our program here on Friday. What a week it's been. I just want to answer a common question before we get to comments. If you ever miss an edition of the 208 and you want to watch it back or you want to rewatch a segment you liked, you can go to the KTVB YouTube page. Just search KTVB there on YouTube and you can find full episodes of the 208 almost immediately after the show finishes. Of course, you can also find all your favorite clips and news and notes from the rest of the Boise uh, coverage area. But let's get to some of these comments here. Bill J writing into us. He says the Sawtooth Valley Dark Sky Reserve. What a great idea. Now that's really the 208 in practice. Yeah, Bill, we got to agree. Just watching the piece Brian and Kevin worked on today. It's really cool to see that Dark Sky Reserve. I got to get out there soon. This person says hashtag Lydia deserves getting a scholarship from KTVB to attend a college of her choice to become a reporter someday. Have a great weekend. I got to tell you, Lydia, I started the same place you started as a big fan at home. So you never know. It may be you answering my questions up here one day. We would love to see that. But Lydia, keep up the good work. This person says, Brian and Joe, I appreciate the 208 daily and thank you for an excellent job. That's from Vicki. Vicki, on behalf of Brian and I, thank you for joining us. I just want to say this one more time. We have such a fantastic team working with the 208 behind the scenes. We know that you see Katya and Andrew, Brian and I here on your screens, but we have a great team behind the scenes. I can't name all of them right now, but uh, just know there's a lot of great go, great teamwork going on. And this person says, I lived in Haley for over 40 years and it was so wonderful to experience the dark skies every night. Upper facing lights were not allowed. So even though it wasn't as dark as you would see in the Sawtooth Valley, it was still beautiful. Susan, I know exactly what you're talking about, because if you get out to a rural area in Idaho or out in the middle of nowhere, look up. It is absolutely amazing. Well, that's the end of our show here on Friday. Everyone take care of each other this weekend. Have some fun out there. We'll see you back here on Monday.